الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونزلنا عليك الكتابة بيانا لكل شيء وهدى ورحمة وبشرى للمسلمين صدق الله العظيم We begin with Allah's blessed name We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers And in particular on the last of them all The blessed Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam As we greet you from here, my home, my sitting room In Kuala Lumpur, in Malaysia On this, the 21st day of Jumadi al-Ula Of the year 1435 Hijri And in the presence of my students from several parts of the world We have Switzerland, we have Morocco We have Senegal, mashallah We have Algeria um, we have Yemen, we have Iraq, um, and Malaysia, <laughs> and so on. Uh, on the topic which is so uh, topical at, at this particular time, Islam, Russia, and Crimea. Crimea, of course, being that peninsula that juts out at the bottom of Ukraine into the Black Sea. And it faces, it faces the city of Constantinople, a straight line from Crimea to Constantinople across the Black Sea. It's just one straight line. This topic is, an, is important in terms of international politics and economics, but our perspective is Il Mu'akhir Zaman or Islamic eschatology and we await we await the analysis to be conducted by other distinguished scholars of Islam on the subject so that ours should not be the only voice on the subject is there a connection between Islam and Russia that's how we should begin is there any connection does Islam have anything to say about Russia Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Time and again, over the last 15 years or more, we have attempted to explain a verse of the Quran in a manner in which it has never been explained before. The response from the world of Islamic scholarship has been astonishingly silent. Neither do they say, that this is wrong, nor do they affirm that it is correct. And so, in order to ring the bell for the scholars of Islam, that they may respond, we repeat it one more time. There is a methodology, of course, which we use for explaining the Quran. And that methodology is taken from our teacher, Marana, Dr. Muhammad Fadlur Rahman Ansari, Rahimahullah, uh, and given in his book, the two-volume work, The Quranic Foundations and Structure of Muslim Society. And that is that you do not take any verse of the Quran or any hadith in isolation to derive meaning. But rather you take the totality of the verses of the Quran on that particular subject. And then seek to locate that which binds them together to make a meaningful whole. Like you seek to read the stars in the sky to know which direction you should travel. You have to know how the stars are related to each other before you can use them to navigate. So the stars no longer constitute just ornament, but rather they will constitute what the Quran calls lamps, masabih. So to the verses of the Quran, when we learn how they are interrelated with each other, they will now become lamps with which to be able 
to guide us to the meanings of verses of the Quran. And Dr. Ansari says that that which binds them together, he calls it the system of meaning. But we have explained this on several occasions in the past, so let us now move on to that verse of the Quran with which we begin to attempt to answer the question, is there a relationship between Islam and Russia? It is in Surah Al-Ma'idah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a command بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا O you who have faith in Allah لَا تَتَّخِذُوا الْيَهُودَ وَالنَّصَارَ أَوْلِيَا Do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies. And we have asked time and again. Is Allah speaking about all Jews? And is He speaking about all Christians? When He prohibits us from maintaining friendly ties with them and being their allies. When we use the proper methodology, the answer is quick and clear. That no Allah could not be speaking about all Jews and all Christians. Example, in the same surah, Allah speaks about the Christian people, who in time to come will be the closest of all people to you Muslims in love and in affection. That you will find in time to come that those who will have the greatest love and affection for you Muslims will be those who say we are Christians. So Allah could not be speaking about all Christians when he says, don't take them as your friends and allies. Hmm? But before we continue with that verse of Surah Al-Ma'idah, do not take them as your friends and allies, let us spend a little moment on this one, that in time to come you will find those who are closest in love and affection for you Muslims will be those who say, we are Christians. Are we allowed to ask the question? Who are those Christians? Where are they in the world? Can we identify them? In order to answer that question, where do we start? You always start with the Qur'an. The Qur'an explains itself. Does the Qur'an identify any Christians with whom we have a friendly relationship? That's the question. If the Qur'an identifies such a Christian people, we don't need to go beyond the Qur'an. Yes, the Qur'an does identify a Christian people with whom we have a friendly relationship. It does so in which surah? The entire surah is named after them. Surah to Rome. Rome. Who is Rome? There are those who would, without any shame, without even any blush, would declare that Rome is Washington. And Rome is NATO. <laughs> yes, a people with no sense of shame at all and with not even a, a fraction of an iota of scholarship in them. Allah speaks of Rome only once in the whole Quran. The word Rome appears only once in the whole Quran. And here it is. Alif Lam Mim. One day, I believe, if we use the proper methodology, and after all the events have unfolded that are to unfold, someone will be able to explain Alif Lam Mim, Alif Lam Ra. Yeah, I see. 
but only after you use the proper methodology. So far, no one has done it. So we leave it there. Alif la mim ghulibatil rum. Rum has been defeated. This is the accepted reading of the verse. The passive tense. Rum has been defeated. Fi al ard. Rome has been defeated in a land close by. They couldn't stand for Washington. There was no United States of America when the Quran was revealed. There was no NATO when the Quran was revealed. Have they no sense? Rome has been defeated in a land close by. But the Quran is prophesying, divine prophecy, that after their defeat, they are going to be victorious. How soon? In just a few years. Not a long period of time. Did this happen? Yes, it did. Who was it? It was the Orthodox Christian Byzantine Empire which had its capital in Constantinople. And they were defeated in the land close by by the Persian Empire. And then within a few years they were able to turn the tables and they were victorious over the Persian Empire. This prophecy, divine prophecy in the Quran was fulfilled. Lillahi al-amr. Decision making is with Allah. Not with NATO. Not with the Security Council of the United Nations. Lillahi al-amr. Decision making is with Allah. Min qabl. Wa min ba'd. Mim qabl wa mim ba'd. On the previous occasion, it was Allah who decided. And on the next occasion, it is Allah who will decide. So there's the next, there's another occasion when Rome will once again be victorious. Let us repeat that. This second one could not refer, as some commentators of the Quran would like us to believe, to the conquest of Makkah. Rome never conquered Makkah. No. The Quran is referring to a victory by Rome. Min kabl wa min ba. And so there is a previous victory, and then there is a subsequent, another victory, which is to come. And on that day, on the previous occasion, when Rome was victorious, the Muslims or the believers celebrated. And on that day, which is to come, on the other occasion, when Rome will once again be victorious, on that day the Muslims are going to celebrate. Bi Nasrillah. With Allah's help. Yansuru may yesha. Allah helps whomsoever Allah chooses to help. Wallahu azizur rahim. And Allah is powerful. And Allah is kind and merciful. This verse of the Qur'an clearly, without any ambiguity whatsoever, directs attention to a group of Christians with whom we Muslims have a positive relationship. And I'm not talking about the Ottoman Empire. No. I'm talking about the rest of the Muslims. The Ottoman Empire is a different kettle of fish from the rest of the world of Islam. 
we have a positive relationship with Rome. And then when Allah says that in time to come you will find that those who have the greatest love and affection for you Muslims will be those who say we are Christians. Obviously, we can identify the Christians now with whom we'll have that loving relationship. The answer is Rome. Is Russia a part of Rome? Whoever says no should buy a one-way ticket to the moon. Go and live there. Don't come back here. Russia is most certainly a part of Rome. Russia is indeed the leader of Rome at this time. When Constantinople was conquered by the Ottomans, then the capital of Rome shifted. It could no longer be Constantinople. The patriarch in Constantinople had to be a citizen of Turkey. <laughs> had to be Turkish. <laughs> so that could not be anymore the capital of Rome. Moscow then replaced Constantinople. But whether Moscow re replaced Constantinople or not, you may want to argue with me. I don't have time to argue. What we are saying, and if I'm wrong, I invite you, my critics, to come forward with integrity. And don't hide behind pseudonyms. Use your name if you want to offer a criticism. This is scholarly integrity. If you want to criticize Imran Hussein and you're afraid to use your name, you're not a scholar. No. We say that Russia is a part of Rome. We are absolutely correct in that statement. And therefore there is a relationship between Islam and Russia. Because the relationship between Islam and Rome and Russia is a part of Rome. And that relationship is one which is positive. History may have a lot of blood in it that is otherwise, and you can blame the Ottoman Empire for that, but don't blame the Quran. So now let's go back. O you who have faith in Allah Most High, do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies. You can do all kind of mathematics that you want to do. You cannot avoid the conclusion. It is a valid conclusion. It is unassailable that Allah is not talking about all Jews and He's not talking about all Christians. And hence we have the right to ask the following question. Well then which Jews and which Christians is he talking about? This methodology is unassailable. We know that there have been several efforts to explain this verse of the Quran. Several efforts, meritorious efforts. May Allah bless them for their struggle. But this methodology that we are using is unassailable. Which Jews and which Christians is Allah speaking about? When he says, don't take them as your friends and allies. And we say, the answer is there in the words which follow. Ba'aduhum awliya'uba. As plain as daylight. The answer is, Ba'aduhum awliya'uba. Allah is saying, do not take such Jews and do not take such Christians as your friends and allies, ba'aduhum awliya ubad, who themselves are friends and allies of each other. In other words, the Quran is telling us, or you may want to use the word the Quran is anticipating. 
If you have any problems with the word anticipate, well, the Quran is telling us that there's going to come a time when a mysterious reconciliation between Jews and Christians is going to take place. A Jewish, a Jewish Christian alliance is going to emerge in history. When the Jewish Christian alliance takes place, then Allah is commanding us, do not take them as your friends and allies. Has that Jewish Christian alliance emerged? The only ones who seem to be unaware of that are those who are waging their Yankee Jihad in Syria and they don't have time for the Quran. And the Yankee Jihad in Libya and they don't have time for the Quran. No. The rest of us know that the Jewish Christian Alliance has emerged. Yes, it has. It is the Zionist Jew and the Zionist Christian who have bonded themselves together in the Judeo Judeo Christian Zionist Alliance. And they are the ones who took power in Britain, causing the British government <laughs> to issue the Balfour Declaration in 1917. They are the ones who took control of power in the United States of America, establishing a mysterious relationship with the United States and Israel, as Britain had with Israel before. They're the ones who today have NATO as their military arm. They're the ones who defy every law, domestic law, international law, every law they defy. They break every law in order to achieve their objectives. They use deception, they use monstrous lies, they use oppression, and then they come to you and tell you, you must obey the law. You are breaking the law <laughs> when they don't have even an utter sh any shame on their faces. But you've broken the law so many times. Mm. These are the ones who want to control the world. They're the ones who want to establish one world government. I don't know what's wrong with the world of Islamic scholarship. That they seem to be so happy talking and lecturing about peanuts and keeping the Muslim masses happy out there with halwa while a people are attempting to take control of power all over the whole world. And the silence from the world of Islamic scholarship is so profound, it's embarrassing. Embarrassing. These are the people who brought the state of Israel into being. These are the people who have kept Israel alive. And these are the people who want to rule the world, Islamic eschatology says, so that they could give to Israel the status of ruling state in the world. Why do they want Israel to rule the world? The rest of us know it. The only ones who don't know it are those who are waging their Yankee Jihad in Syria. They don't have time for this. They want Israel to rule the world so that tomorrow a man will stand up in Israel Nabi Muhammad Islam described that man to us. He said he would be a Jew, not a system. He said he would be a Jew. He said he'd be a young man. He'd be powerfully built. He'll have curls. The Orthodox Jews have curls. And he would declare from Jerusalem, I am the Messiah, Al-Masih. But he would not be the Messiah because he would not be the son of Maryam alayhi salam. He would be al-Masih al-Dajjal. All of us know that. They don't know it as yet. They're too busy waiting the Yankee Jihad, taking weapons from NATO, begging NATO to expose a no-fly zone so they could bomb the Gaddafi out of existence so they can then take over Libya. With all the help of NATO, they could never have taken over Libya. No. So they took help from the enemies of Islam. They took help from those that Allah prohibited us from maintaining friendly ties from them, with them. And now they parade themselves as Mujahideen. No, they are Dajjal's warriors. 
This then is the Quran explaining to us the world today. Do not be their friends. Do not be their allies. Is the world of Islamic scholarship aware of this verse in the Quran? Are our learned and distinguished scholars of Islam around the world even aware of this verse in the Quran? That Allah is prohibiting us from maintaining friendly ties and being allies of a Judeo-Christian alliance. The, the silence from the world of Islamic scholarship is so profound it is now embarrassing. What is the price that we pay if we violate the law and maintain friendly ties with them? What is the price we pay if we enter into their embrace? For example, they destroy the Khilafah and they replace this with this bogus modern Republican state which declares that Allah is no longer Al-Akbar and Al-Malik. Sovereignty now belongs to the state. And we all are incorporated into this system within the United Nations. What is the price that we pay if we violate the order of the Quran and enter into the embrace? What is the price we pay if we allow them to remove dinar and dirham from the market and they replace it with this bogus paper, plastic and electronic money which is ripping us off. We enter into their political embrace, we enter into their monetary embrace. What is the price that we pay? What is the price that we pay if we enter into their market? The market that they establish and control, which is the market of thieves. Where banking system now rules the world of the market. A banking system based on riba. If we do that, what price do we pay? I did not ask, have we done it? I'm asking, if we do it, what is our price? Allah says, وَمَنْ يَتَوَلَّهُ مِنْكُمْ فَإِنَّهُ مِنْهُمْ Whosoever from amongst you turn to them with that relationship of friendship and alliance, entering into the embrace, you now belong to them. You are no longer Muslim. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَهْدِ الْقَوْمَ الظَّالِمِينَ And Allah does not provide the islands for a people who are wicked. With this fundamentally important verse of the Quran, we now are able to recognize one half of the Christian world which is a, in an alliance with Jews, that those Christians which are in alliance with Jews, we are not allowed to be friends with them. And another part of the Christian world identified in the Quran as room and they will be victorious. And when they are victorious, we will celebrate. We now turn to our subject proper. If the Quran has informed us that we have a positive relationship with Rome, then should we not be striving and struggling Through the vicissitudes of warfare, sometimes there may be a skirmish here or there, but our diplomatic philosophy would be to always seek to establish relationship with them which is friendly, not perpetual jihad. No. Is it not strange, therefore? that for 500 years an Ottoman Empire that would like us to believe that it was an Islamic Empire waged eternal jihad on Rome while maintaining friendly ties with the other Christians. The Ottoman Empire always had good relations with Britain and good relations with France. Ottoman diplomats spoke French fluently. <laughs> and the Ottoman Empire was always engaged in warfare and hostility and in inculcating hatred 
amongst the people of Rome. That sounds suspicious to me. Strange and suspicious. Who is the drum beater beating the drum to which the Ottoman Empire is dancing? Hmm? Who is that drum beater who wants to sabotage Islam's relationship with Rome? Of all the things that the Ottoman Empire did with Rome, and we have mentioned in previous lectures many of them, the ones which are more pertinent at this moment is the number of wars they fought with Russia. So many wars with Russia we can't count anymore. War after war after war after war with Russia. In consequence of which naturally the Russians should have hatred in their hearts for Muslims. No wonder therefore that the Russians would be hostile to Muslims living in their vicinity. That should not be a surprise. No. How can Russia feel good about Muslims and treat them nicely and maintain friendly ties with them when the capital of Islam is waging war, continuous war on Russia? But that's not all. It's not only war on Russia. It's not only capturing Christian women through warfare, enslaving them, and stocking the harem with Christian women. The Sultan never married. They had an endless stable of slaves, an endless stable of European women and slaves, some of them Russian. And then they would take Christian boys, these are boys of Rome, convert them to Islam, and then raise them to be part of the elite fighting force of the Ottoman Empire, the Janissaries. And so the sons of Rome would be used to fight Rome. That is adding insult to injury. Was this calculated? Are they doing these things deliberately to sabotage for all times to come any possibility of friendship and alliance with Rome? Is it by accident that when they conquered Constantinople, the first thing that they did was to take the cathedral of Rome, Hagia Sophia, which was the most magnificent building of Christian world and which had functioned as their cathedral, the major cathedral for 1,000 years and then shamefully and disgracefully and manifestly sinfully and I wish I could get another scholar of Islam somewhere in the world to speak these words that I am speaking convert that cathedral to a masjid. Shame on you. Shame on you. Shame on you, we say, to the Ottoman Empire and to Sultan Muhammad Fatih. No wonder Imran Hussein is now banned in Turkey. The Turkish Muslims can no longer listen to my lectures. No. Turkey is scared because the bubble is bursting. You can kill a man you can assassinate him, but you cannot kill the truth. Even the Israeli Mossad now realizes that. You can't keep on killing people because that's not going to kill the truth. The truth will triumph one day. The truth cannot be defeated. And this is the truth which is now coming out about the Ottoman Empire. So not only do we have a Russia which is filled with hatred for Muslims, but now something else. It appears that when the Mongols, Genghis Khan, came out to the west, they brought with them the Tatar people who settled in Crimea, that peninsula jutting out into the Black Sea. 
And the Tatar have been there for hundreds of years now in Crimea. They were once the majority population in Crimea. It was once a Khanit, they call it a Khanit. If I am wrong, I would like to be corrected. But the historical record appears to be saying, and this will have to be accepted until it is refuted, that the Crimean economy under the Tatars was based on slave hunting. They went on raids in that region, Russia being the prime target, and they would capture people, innocent people, who have done nothing wrong, and then enslave them, and then supply the slaves to the Ottoman Empire. Shame, 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 shame on the Ottoman Empire. They should never use the word Islam. Take out the word Islam. Is that how you get slaves? Innocent people in Russia? And the Tatar goes and raiding them and capturing them and then supplying the slaves to the Ottoman Empire? If I am wrong, I invite the Tatar Muslims in Crimea to kindly correct me. And I will apologize. But this is what the historical record says. And so now we have a situation where while the book speaks about a positive relationship, the concrete reality is the opposite. Which one is going to survive in Akhiru Zaman? The answer is that the Zionists knew full well that the greatest threat that they faced was not so much the world of Islam but room. They knew that. And when Allah says in the Quran about the body of Firaun, Surah to Yunus, that when Firaun was drowning, he realized that he wasn't God. He was dying. And then he made his declaration of faith in the God of Banu Israel. To which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded and says, Allah, now Pharaoh, before this, you were in arrogant rejection, and you were causing havoc and corruption and destruction in the world. This day we have, provided, we have preserved your physical body. So this physical body will not be destroyed. No, it will be preserved. But when your physical body is discovered in time to come, when it resurfaces in the historical process, it will be a sign for a people to come after you. But most people are just too busy to bother about the signs of Allah. <laughs> Afternoon traffic, morning traffic, too busy. So they're negligent about the signs of Allah. What is that sign? The body of Pharaoh was discovered. The prophecy, the divine prophecy in the Quran was fulfilled. The body of Pharaoh was discovered in 1898, about the same time that the Zionist movement was established. So what is the sign? No one prior to this has ever offered any explanation other than this is a divine prophecy, it has been fulfilled, therefore the Quran is the word of Allah. When we turn to Islamic eschatology, we are, offered, we are able to offer a new meaning. That the sign is much more than simply fulfillment of a divine prophecy. No. That the body was preserved 
under the body was rediscovered at the time when it was rediscovered was significant. The moment when it was rediscovered, what is the significance? Answer. In consequence of the birth of the Zionist movement, history will now repeat itself. This is our opinion. And we have constantly warned, when we give an opinion, don't accept it. Never, never, never accept our opinion unless and until you are convinced that it is correct. This is the respect we have for the intellect of our students. We never ever say, don't listen to that man. Don't listen to this man. Not us. We don't do that. History will now repeat itself. The epic encounter between truth and falsehood, between Fir'aun and Musa al-Islam, between power of those who are arrogant oppressors and the powerlessness of the oppressed, of Musa al-Islam and Banu Israel, will now be repeated in history. And when the body is discovered, the countdown begins. The last countdown of Akhir Zaman began when the body was discovered. In the year 1902, we found something strange. The Zionists were able to, to convene a conference in Paris to plot the downfall of the Ottoman Empire. <laughs> 1902. Paris. Oh, but France was always a friend of the Ottomans. Britain was always a friend of the Ottomans. Eh? And now in Paris the meeting takes place. It took them six years. Between 1902 and 1908. Only six years. It is stupendous. It is incredible. It's beyond understanding that in such a short period of time, they were able to launch a revolution which toppled the Sultan and the Khalifa. Abdul Hamid was forced to step down. And in his place came a godless secular regime, nationalists, to take over control of the Ottoman Empire. And the stage is now set for the Zionists to achieve their goals. In the next year, 1809, 1909, Britain and France reached out to Russia to get Russia to enter into a triple alliance. Why? Because they want to checkmate the Ottoman Empire. The big war is coming. The Ottomans cannot turn to Britain and France in an alliance when Russia is in the alliance, because the hatred for Russia is too great amongst the Ottomans. So by Britain and France embracing Russia in an alliance, it checks made the Ottoman Empire. The only way you could do now is to turn to Germany, nothing else. The pieces are being moved in the chessboard. What the British and the French also did was to offer to Russia Constantinople. And Russia is so happy. This is our spiritual capital. This is where Hagia Sophia is. And so Russia is happy to enter into this alliance with Britain and France. And then came the First World War. And when the Russian forces were within an arm's length of Constantinople to take it, the Zionists struck. They offered Russia one thing from the front door and they stabbed Russia from the back door. The Zionists struck in October of 1917 with the Bolshevik Revolution. As soon as the Bolshevik Revolution is conducted by Russian Jews, Russian Jews, yeah. 
This is not a secret. As soon as the Bolshevik Revolution took place, the new Bolshevik government took Russia out of the war. Why? Why did you take Russia out of the war immediately that the revolution took place? Immediately. Why? Because the Bolshevik revolution was a Zionist revolution. And the Zionists did not want Russia to get Constantinople. Because they perceived Russia and Rome to constitute the most potent threat to their designs in the Holy Land for the establishment of a state of Israel. That's why. Not only did the Bolshevik Revolution result in Russia being taken out of the war and therefore Constantinople is safe, but they then proceeded to bring about a communist revolution. Communism or Marxist ideology delivering an economic system, an economic philosophy which had much in it that is meritorious. Oh yes. And there are many in Russia today and many in the, so the former Soviet Union who look back, look back to communism with nostalgia, because in many respects that was superiorism to this doggy dog capitalism that they have today. Oh yes. But that was just the icing on the cake. Inside the cake was a rotten apple. The icing on the cake was all the nice labor laws, which ensured labor justice and so on. But inside the cake, what the communist Soviet Union, which now is established, was doing, was waging war on religion in general and waging war on Rome in particular, seeking to destroy the Christian faith, seeking to destroy monasteries, churches, killing the priests and the scholars. And this continued in the Soviet Union for years and years and years and years. The Soviet Union not only waged that war on Rome on Israel's behalf, <laughs> but more than that. When Israel came into being in 1948, it is the Soviet Union which then opened its doors for millions of Russian Jews to migrate to the Holy Land while pretending to be friends of the Arabs. And so Israel came into being in 1948. And within a few years you saw the traffic of Russian Jews migrating to Israel. In 1954, something strange and mysterious took place. And up to this day, I don't think the Russian people understand how and why it took place. <laughs> In 1954, six years after Israel was born, the Soviet Union, under the leadership of Nikita Khrushchev, who was not a Russian, he was a Ukrainian, transferred the territory of Crimea, which was for hundreds of years Russian territory, transferred it to Ukraine. So the people of Ukraine went to sleep as citizens of Russia and woke up next morning without any consultation whatsoever as citizens of Ukraine. Hey, how come? We were never consulted. We had no part to play at all in this transfer of, of, of the territory. Why, why, why did the Soviet Union 
transfer the territory of Crimea from Russia to Ukraine in 1954. We say, from the perspective of Islamic eschatology, that this transfer of power has more to do in it than tourism. <laughs> yeah, it's not because Crimea is a tourist designation with all the spas and so on, not at all. Answer is, the Soviet Union is sabotaging Russia. As the Soviet Union sabotaged Russia in 1917 by taking Russia out of the war when Constantinople was just an arm's length away, so too in 1954 the Soviet Union sabotaged Russia so that Russia will now be in a precarious position because the Russian fleet, the Black Sea fleet, is located in a naval base in Crimea. The Russian fleet has been there for two, three hundred years. <laughs> but now it's no longer Russian territory. So if a tomorrow comes, when a Ukrainian government comes into being that is pro-West, the news will be around the neck of Russia. And so now from the perspective of Islamic eschatology, we can proceed with the topic Islam, Russia and Crimea. What happened in this so-called color revolution, where you, it's called rent a mob, you pay them the money and they go out on the streets. <laughs> and you pay them the money and they go and they start random shooting, sniping and so on, typers, rent them up. And you pay these mercenaries. And uh, you're doing it in Venezuela, Venezuela now, to incite a revolution against the democratically elected government in Ukraine. And after about three months of demonstrations and rioting on the streets, of Ukraine, the president of Ukraine fled out of Ukraine. And we felt that Russia had been outmaneuvered and that the Zionists have now secured the last link that they needed to put the chain around Russia's neck. Remember, the transfer of the territory from Russia to Ukraine. And now, a color revolution to bring into power in Ukraine a pro-Western government, which will be anti-Russia. And as a consequence, the rope will be around Russia's neck. And the naval base in Crimea, Crimea will now be in jeopardy. Russia can no longer consider itself a superpower. Now, if you lose. If Russia loses Crimea, Russia, Russia's credentials as a superpower will now be in doubt. What did Russia do? What has happened over the last few days constitutes, in my opinion, the first major setback, the first major setback that the Zionist movement has ever experienced in its history of more than a hundred years. That is the implication of what has occurred in the last few days. That instead of the rope being around Russia's neck, Russia was able to take steps to emerge stronger than it has ever been before. From 1954, when Crimea was handed over to Ukraine in a very undemocratic way, without any consultation of the people, without the permission of the people of Crimea, 
and consultation with the Russian people now. Nothing else on. In this very undemocratic way. Since 1954 to this day, Russia's position in Crimea, Crimea has always been problematic. Ebbs and flows, ups and downs in the relationship. Sometimes the Crimeans, uh, the, the Ukrainians are threatening Russia. We're going to terminate the lease. You're going to have to get back up and move. <laughs> Instead of that relationship that they had from 1954 to today, which was precarious, which is vulnerable, Russia now has, <coughs> with the consent of the people of Crimea, who voted overwhelmingly in favor of union with Russia. And Russia has incorporated Crimea in its territory. So Crimea today is once again a part of Russia. And it is time for Imran Hussein to celebrate. <laughs> it is time for Imran Hussein to celebrate. The only ones who will not join me in celebrating is Dajjal's warriors out there in Syria. And Dajjal's warriors, no matter what kind of jihad they say they are in, no matter who they are, they say they are Mujahideen, ask me, where are you getting your weapons from? These sophisticated weapons that you're using, have you manufactured them yourself? Answer me truthfully if, if it is still possible for you to speak the truth. The answer is, it is the enemies of Islam who are supplying all the weapons. And you want to tell me you are engaged in a legitimate jihad? What rubbish! Since when do the enemies of Islam provide the weapons for a legitimate jihad? Huh? Huh, since when? The, the fact that Crimea is now Russian territory is not only a cause for rejoicing amongst those Muslims who have a little bit of knowledge, who are different from the cattle. The cattle have no knowledge. But more than that, it now provides opportunities for the world of Islam, not the governments, because the governments are controlled. What are the opportunities? The Zionist controlled Western world has been shouting from the mountaintops, we're going to punish Russia. They're using the German Chancellor most of all. We're going to impose sanctions on Russia. We're going to punish Russia. We're not going to take this lying down. And then they came out with their massive sanctions on Russia about 15 people who are not allowed to travel. They removed their visas and they froze their bank accounts. But the 15 people said, well, we don't have any bank accounts. <laughs> so what are you freezing? <laughs> well, what, a, what a monumental sanctions is this? Yeah, it is em embarrassing to the rest of the world to see the mighty powerful European Union and the NATO alliance in resorting to a few individuals. So we are likely to see uh, an incremental increase in sanctions on Russia. But the Russians have responded and they have declared quite firmly there's going to be tit for tat. This is not Libya. <laughs> no, this is Russia. This is not Iran. This is Russia. And we have a friend in China. <laughs> so, so if you impose sanctions on us, we have the capacity to respond. And the damage will be done to all of us, not just to us. You will also be damaged. And they believe Putin. They know that he's going to do it. But the Zionists have suffered such an embarrassing defeat in Crimea 
that they have no alternative but to proceed with sanctions. Otherwise, they'll be the laughing stock of the world. And in this war of sanctions which we are now going to witness, there's opportunity for Islam, opportunity for Muslims. For example, Dean Aaron Dirham. An opportunity for Dean Aaron Dirham. When they impose sanctions, the trump card that they have is a banking system. So banks are going to refuse to deal with Russia. <laughs> okay? When Russians want to trade now, they can't trade. They can't, they can't send money through the banking system because the Zionists control the banking system. Here is an opportunity for the world of Islam to try to persuade Russia to make Dean Aaron Dirham legal tender. They could call it by whatever name they want. And if Russia were to make gold and silver coins legal tender, that creates an opportunity for the world of Islam. We now have a bigger market with which we can engage in trade, bypassing the electronic money banking system. Now to come to the last part of the talk. The fact that Russia is standing up to the Zionists, not only throws into the garbage bin the arguments raised by others that Russia is a Zionist state, <laughs> but more than that, it sets the stage for Armageddon because the Zionists are pursuing it pig-headed obsession, a pig, P-I-G, pig-headed obsession to rule the world. It doesn't matter to them what is the price, that doesn't matter. So if the price is world war with Russia, so be it. If the price is that most of mankind must perish, so be it. It doesn't matter to them. The Zionists, they don't have mind of their own to think. Their minds are controlled by Dajjal. So the stage is now set for Armageddon, or what the Prophet ﷺ called the Malhamah. And from the perspective of Islamic eschatology, while the rest of the world of Islamic scholarship seems obsessed with teaching peanuts, that's all they teach, peanuts. From the perspective of Islamic eschatology, we know that the next major event to occur in history is going to be the Malhamah based on the hadith of the Sunan of Abi Dawood. Umran Ubayt al-Maqdis, Kharabu Yathrib. Kharabu Yathrib, Khuruj al-Malhamah. Khuruj al-Malhamah, Fatul Constantiniya. Fatul Constantiniya, Khuruj al-Dajjal. That there are events which fall in line, the timeline. The first being that Jerusalem emerges as center stage in the world. Second, that Medina is now in full-on desolation. And now the third, which these two already have passed, come to pass, the third is the Malhama. Once the Malhama breaks out, which can take place any time now, it's going to be soon. How soon? I don't know. Nobody knows. But we know it's soon. Once the Malhama takes place, that's the cue for all of Algeria. And we have an Algerian here. We have two Algerians here. We have three Algerians here, mashallah. <laughs> Once the Malhamah takes place, that's the cue for you in Algeria. That's the cue for you in Morocco and in Tunisia to head to join the army. The army that will conquer Constantinople. Because that's the prophecy of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu when I went to Moscow last July and I informed them about Islamic eschatology, informing them that on the basis of Islamic eschatology, we know that there's a conquest of Constantinople that is coming, prophesied by the Prophet Muhammad That's why they have banned me in Turkey. They don't want the Turkish people to know. They don't want the Turkish Muslims to know 
that the conquest of Constantinople prophesied by Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam has not as yet taken place. No. It is to take place in Akhiru Zaman. Don't come with this rubbish that there are two conquests in order to fudge the books <laughs> to give some kind of legitimacy to Muhammad Fatih. Not at all. There's only one conquest of Constantinople prophesied by Prophet Muhammad That's the honest answer. So they were surprised in Rome, in Moscow. The Orthodox Christian world was not surprised because they have the same prophecy. Christian eschatology is that Christianity is going to conquer Constantinople in Akhiru Zaman. And our Muslim eschatology is that Muslims are going to conquer Constantinople in Akhiru Zaman. Hmm? And more than that, Nabi Muhammad wasalam, prophesied that there's going to be an alliance of Muslims with Rome. Now the pieces on the chessboard are being put in place. The first major move on the chessboard occurred just a few days ago when Russia took control of Crimea. Why is Crimea so important in Akhiru Zaman? I'll tell you why. You don't need a PhD from MIT to know that the great war that's coming is going to be fought with nuclear weapons. No. You don't need a PhD to know that once nuclear weapons start, it's going to be a fight to the finish. So thousands of nuclear weapons are going to be used. You don't need a PhD to know that not only would most of mankind perish, and most of mankind seems to deserve to perish because they've turned away from Allah. But more than that, that the radiation which will be emitted from the explosion of thousands of nuclear weapons is going to so pollute the atmosphere that the Prophet said وسلم, that even birds will fall down. Why will birds fall down? Because the birds can no longer navigate the pollution of the atmosphere with electronic waves, electromagnetic waves and so on. The birds can no longer navigate. So if birds can no longer navigate, navigate, then that's goodbye to electronic warfare. That's goodbye to aircrafts. <laughs> Nothing will fly after that. Nothing will fly after that. No cruise missiles can be used after that. No air-to-surface missiles can be used after that. No, not after the Malhama. For the wars are going to be fought after the Malhama on the land and on the sea, not in the air. And the wars are going to be fought on the land and on the sea. Now then, there's a straight line between Crimea and Constantinople. And we can now understand why the Zionists probably cannot digest the dinner after the events of the last few days. While the world of Islamic scholarship continues to sleep, so soundly are they sleeping, they're even snoring now. So soundly are they sleeping, they're even snoring now. But over the last few days, what has happened? is that the straight line between Crimea and Constantinople is now clearly visible. And so the attack that will take place on Constantinople will be on the land and on the sea. The naval attack from Crimea to Constantinople, just across the Black Sea, and the land attack when the Algerians, and we have three Algerians here, the land attack 
by an army that Nabi Muhammad Islam prays when he said Lataftahanna the Constantinia you'll most certainly conquer Constantinople. Notice I've never used any other name for the city. No. Notice I've said about Mustafa Kamal, Mustafa Kamal you can get lost. You and all the Turkish people who worship you get lost. If the Prophet of Islam referred to the city by the name of Constantinople, you cannot prevent a Muslim from using that name because that is Sunnah to use the name Constantinople. And so Constantinople is going to be attacked by an army, a land army. And the Prophet praised that army. He praised the commander of that army and he praised that army that is going to conquer Constantinople. And so the conquest of Constantinople will take place on the basis of an alliance with Rome. We've seen this part of the alliance. The army that's going to come from Algeria, Morocco, all over. And that part, which is going to be the naval one, coming in a straight line from Crimea to Constantinople. Once the, cons the city of Constantinople is captured, the back of NATO is broken. The Russian fleet can enter the Mediterranean. And that is going to be perilous for Israel. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may give to our people a light with which to see and understand what so many today do not understand and give them backbones to stand up and proclaim the truth regardless of the price we have to pay. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta samir alim wa tub alayna ya mawlana inna ka anta tawab rahim bi rahmatika ya akhma rahimin. Ameen. I believe the audience out there who are going to be listening to this lecture tomorrow, Jamal, by tomorrow, inshallah, would be happy and appreciated if you all have any questions so I can answer them. Sisters, you too. Yeah. You heard about, about uh, Foreign Affairs Minister of uh, Russia were in Tunisia last week. I spoke with Algeria about American troops in the Iberic Peninsula and in Tunisia and warning Algeria about possible plot against, against uh, their, um, their, their, their country. And, and um, he, he, he said, yeah, we are your, your allies, so be, be aware of what is going on your back and uh, we can uh, help you if you need. Mm -hmm. The events that are occurring in the south of Algeria now, yes. Um, the events which are occurring in the south of Algeria have a connection to our subject in that while there are Salafi Muslims who are sincere and learned and uh, many of them are more and more attracted to, to the message I'm delivering. Some of them have already become my students uh, and I'm getting emails from others who want to become my students and they're Salafi. There are others who are engaged in a fanatical, blind and fanatical, bogus jihad. I call them the Jaws warriors and they are being provided with funds and weapons by you know who. These are the ones who are there in south of Algeria, creating conditions of havoc in an otherwise peaceful region of the world. Um, 
wherever these people appear. You know the design, the map is drawn by the Zionists. <laughs> so it will appear that the Zionists have now come around to using this method of seeking to destabilize Algeria. Um, uh, I, I, I would hope that my words can reach to the Algerian people to turn away from the Dajjal's warriors in the south, to recognize them as Dajjal's warriors who are now seeking to destabilize Algeria in the name of Islam, in the name of Jihad, to recognize them for what they are, a people who are acting on behalf of the Dajjal. Yeah. Any other questions? Sisters? Islam we are prohibited from waging war on any people whatsoever <coughs> unless and until two conditions apply that they commit aggression against us and we are the victims of aggression and that did not apply in the Ottoman Empire, no. And number two, that a people are oppressed and they are weak and helpless and cannot withstand the power of the oppressor. And they, the oppressed, call on us for help. To which Allah responds in the Quran, وَمَا لَكُمْ لَا تُقَاتِلُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَالْمُسْتَلْعَفِينَ مِنَ الرِّجَالِ وَالنِّسَاءِ وَالْوِلْدَانِ أَلَّذِينَ يَكُولُونَ رَبَّنَا أَخْرِجْنَا مِنْ هَذِهِ الْقَرْيَةِ ظَالِمِ أَهْلُهَا إِلَى آخِرِ الْآيَةِ They are crying out for help. Send someone who will deliver us from this oppression. When the Muslim army marches to deliver them, the oppressed are going to welcome the army. Okay? No Christian in Eastern Europe ever welcomed the Ottomans. No. The population not only hated the Ottomans, but to this day they hated them. So this was a bogus jihad on behalf of the Ottomans. And it is shameful, it is disgraceful that Islamic scholarship cannot recognize that the Ottomans were waging a bogus jihad for 500 years. There is another philosophy which says that Islam has ordained eternal jihad against all the world until Islam imposes Islamic rule over the whole world. And when we impose our rule over you, you have a choice. You can remain Muslim, I mean Christian, or you can become Muslim. If you want to remain Christian, you pay jizya. But our duty is to rule the world. This is Dajjal's warriors. Those idiots in Syria, those idiots in Libya, and I call them idiots, I call them fools. They're going to be angry with me. I know. One of these days they might want to come and even attack me. It doesn't matter to me. My answer to them is you can kill a man, but you cannot kill the truth. Okay, this question, the first question was from Algeria, the second question was from Malaysia, the third question is from Iraq, northern Iraq, Kurdistan. 
And he wants to know, well, if thousands of nuclear weapons are going to be used in the Malhara, what are we to do? The answer is, life and death are in Allah's hands. If Allah has not written death for you, no one can take your life. And if Allah has written death for you, nothing that you do can prevent death from taking place. So you continue, proceed, proceed to act in accordance with the divine guidance in the Qur'an. The divine guidance in the Qur'an for Akhirul Zaman is in which surah? Surah Al-Kafir. That when you see the city stinking, the city collapsing, the city becoming uh, Solomon Gomorrah, governments enacting legislation, that a man can marry another man and get a marriage certificate, then that's the time for you to act in the manner that the young men in Surah Al-Kaf acted. Withdraw from the cities. Tablik Jamaat, let them remain in the city. Let Tablik Jamaat remain in the city. Blind Tablik Jamaat. Okay? And let them continue their gush and so on in the cities. No problem. And they'll get, they will get visas to go anywhere they want to go, Tablik Jamaat will get visa. If they want to go to the moon, they'll get a visa to go to the moon. No problem. You and I, however, we withdraw from the cities. And we go to the countryside to protect our wives and protect our children and protect ourselves from the attack on faith which is taking place in the city. That is all. We are not leaving the city and going to the countryside in order to survive the malhama. No. We are leaving the city and going to the countryside to preserve faith. Go oh, one question at a time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, this question from Senegal. I said that if the European Union and the United States impose sanctions on Russia, economic sanctions, the Russians have already declared it's tit for tat, we're going to retaliate. It is therefore inevitable the sanctions are going to be imposed on Russia through the banking system. Inevitable that you see the Russian ruble collapsing in value. Uh, when I was there in Moscow in July, the ruble was trading at about 33 rubles to one dollar US. Yesterday I saw it at something around 36. And I wouldn't be surprised if in the next few days it goes down to 40, 45 and so on, as sanctions are imposed. I said that this creates an opportunity for us. If we can get and persuade the Russian government to declare gold and silver coins as legal tender, once you declare it's legal tender, we can now trade with Russia can buy and sell. You don't have to transport the gold and transport the silver. No. All through history, they've always had mechanisms for handling this matter. That you would pay in Moscow to someone in Moscow, and this is his business. He has a store of gold dinars and silver dirhams in Moscow, and he has a store in, in KL. Okay? So for a fee, for a fee, you pay him in Moscow and he'll pay the agent in KL and your money is transported this way. Okay? So this, these businesses will immediately emerge. There'll be businessmen who, with business acumen who know you need this kind of thing for transfer of money. 
and this will be outside of the banking system. The Zionists are going to grind their teeth in frustration. Yeah.